नमस्ते नमस्ते मैडम प्रेसिडेंट लेट मी बिगिन बाय ऑफरिंग माय हर्टीज कंग्रेचुलेशंस टू फॉरेन मिनिस्टर लाजाक फॉर बिकमिंग द प्रेसिडेंट ऑफ द सेवेंटी सेकेंड यूनाइटेड नेशंस जनरल असेंबली For those of us fortunate to represent our nations as foreign minister this is a particularly happy event one of us has this honor madam president i had spoken before this assembly last year as well it is a year that has seen much change both in this assembly and in the world it represents we have a new secretary general at the united nations he is determined to prepare and strengthen the united nations to meet the challenges of the 21st century we welcome his efforts and see in him a leader who can give practical shape to a vision madam president our contemporary world is trapped in a deluge of troubles of which surely the most dangerous is the relentless rise of violence terrorism and the ideas that engineer this evil are spreading at the pace of a conflagration climate change stares us in the face and threatens us with its dimension there is a growing question mark over maritime security for a mix of reasons provocative and inflammatory people are leaving the psychological cultural and economic comfort of their traditional home space to seek refuge on distant shores causing global anxiety a large part of the globe's population is still tortured by hunger and poverty the youth are beginning to lose hope as they confront unemployment women victims of historic discrimination are demanding but they must get gender empowerment nuclear proliferation is back in the zone of dangerous headlines cyber security has become a source of deep insecurity in 2015 we set ourselves a target of 2030 to find solutions to many challenges of this agenda two of these years have already passed surely it is already time to ask how much has happened if complacency defines the next 13 years then we are in danger of losing control we need a sense of urgency as well as unshakable fortitude to take decisions that can avert catastrophe i am pleased that india has displayed the courage and leadership to take tough decisions which have launched the interlinked process of sustainable development the complete eradication of poverty is the most important priority of the present government madam president there are two ways of addressing the curse of poverty the traditional method is through incremental levels of aid and had hand holding but our prime minister narendra modi has chosen the more radical route through economic empowerment the poor are not helpless we have merely denied them opportunity we are eliminating poverty by investing in the poor we are turning them from job seekers into job providers all our economic programs have a principal purpose the empowerment of the poor jandhan mudra ujwala skill india digital india clean india startup india stand up india to describe them all would take up more time than i have at my disposal and i shall therefore dwell on only three core programs the jandhan plan must surely count as world's largest financial inclusion scheme those who did not have any money their third bank accounts were opened with zero balance and this would have not have happened anywhere in the world that even if you don't have any money you have a bank account they have a bank passbook but this impossible has been made possible in india at least 300 million indians it
it's not a small amount. This is uh, the total population of United States of America, who had never, 300 million Indians who had never crossed the doors of a bank after their bank accounts. This was understandably not easy to complete in three years, but our banks achieved this visionary goal set by our Prime Minister. While some remain to be included, the target has been set. Every Indian family will have a bank account. Mudra Yojana has enabled government to fund the unfunded. Those who have never dreamt that bank credit will be within their options today through Mudra are getting soft loans without collateral to begin micro business. I am particularly delighted to inform you that 70% of these loans have gone to women. Unemployment spreads despair. Through Skill India, Startup India, Stand Up India, poor and middle class youth are being trained to match their own talent with bank credit and become self employed as small scale entrepreneurs. Ujvala is a signature scheme of our government. For poor women, they had to work hard for their kitchens and sometimes they lose their eyesight because of the smoke. Free gas cylinders are being provided to the poor so that women do not have to suffer the dangerous consequences of wood-fired kitchens. Uniquely, gender emancipation is at the creative core of this program. Demonetization was a courageous decision to challenge one of the byproducts of corruption, the black money, that disappeared from circulation. Today, India has passed the goods and services tax legislation through which there is one tax across the country. Without the untidy and punishing system of multiple taxes under different categories in different parts of the country, our Save the Girl, Educate the Girl campaign is reducing gender inequality. Our Clean India program is generating what can only be described as a revolutionary change in social attitudes and habits. I would like to note at this point that nations with rising capabilities will be able to generate such change, but the developed world must become an active partner in helping those vulnerable countries which are still mired in stagnant poverty reach SDG horizon within 2030. This is why the principal goal of global partnership was included in SDG. I am happy to report that India has started this year the India-UN Development Partnership Fund. Madam President, we are completely engaged in fighting poverty. Alas, our neighbor Pakistan seems only engaged in fighting us. On Thursday, from this dais, Pakistan's Prime Minister Shahid Khakan Abbasi wasted rather too much of his speech in making accusations against us. He accused India of state-sponsored terrorism and of violating human rights. Those listening had only one observation. Look who's talking. A country that has been the world's greatest exporter of havoc, death and inhumanity became a champion of hypocrisy by preaching about humanity and human rights from this podium. Pakistan's Prime Minister claimed that Muhammad Ali Jinnah had bequeathed a foreign policy based on peace and friendship. I would like to remind him that while it remains open to question whether Jinnah Saab actually advocated such principles, what is beyond doubt is that India's Prime Minister Narendra Modi has from the moment he took his oath of office offered the hand of peace and friendship. Pakistan's Prime Minister must answer why this nation, his nation spurned this offer. Prime Minister Abbasi has recalled old resolutions that have been long overtaken by events, but his memory has conveniently failed him where it matters. He has forgotten that under Shimla Agreement and Lahore Declaration, India and Pakistan resolved that they would settle all outstanding disputes and issues bilaterally. The reality is that Pakistan's politicians remember everything, manipulate memory into a convenience. They are masters at forgetting facts that destroy their version. Pakistan's current Prime Minister spoke of a comprehensive dialogue between our two countries. I would like to remind him that on 9th December 2015, when I was in Islamabad for the Hurt of Asia Conference, 
A decision was made by his leader, Mia Nawaz Sharif, then still Prime Minister, then dialogue between us should be renewed and renamed it a comprehensive bilateral dialogue. The word bilateral was used consciously to remove any confusion or doubt about the fact that the proposed talks would be between our two nations and only between our two nations without any third party present. And he must answer why that proposal withered because Pakistan is responsible for the aporting of that peace process. Madam President, I would like today to tell Pakistan's politicians just this much. Ask them that perhaps have they ever thought that India and Pakistan became free within hours of each other? Why is it that today India is recognized as IT superpower in the world and Pakistan is recognized only as the preeminent export factory of terror? What is the reason for this? Have they ever thought? There's only one reason. India has risen despite the principal destination of Pakistan's nefarious export of terrorism. There have been many governments under many parties during 70 years of India's freedom. For we have been a sustained democracy. Every government has done its bit for India's development. We have marched ahead consistently without pause, creating IIMs, IITs, AIMS, and in the fields of in the fields of education, health, space, and across the scientific and technical institutions which are of the pride of the world. But what has Pakistan offered to the world and indeed its own people apart from terrorism? We produce scholars, doctors, engineers, and scientists. They produce terrorist terrorist camps. lashkar e taiba jaish e mohammed hizbul mujahideen Haqqani Network. We produce scholars, doctors, engineers, scientists. What did you make, Pakistan? You created terrorists and jihadis. And you know, doctors save people from death. Terrorists send them to death. Your terrorist organizations are not only attacking India, but are also affecting our two neighbors, Afghanistan are not only attacking India, but are also affecting our two neighbors, Afghanistan and Bangladesh. Madam President, in the history of UNG, it may be a first that a country asked for a right of reply and it had to answer to three countries. Does this only fact not depict the reality of their actions? If Pakistan had spent on its development what it has spent on developing terror, both Pakistan and the world would be safer and better off today. Madam President, terrorism is at the very top of problems for which the United Nations is searching for solutions. We have been the oldest victims of this terrible and even traumatic terrorism. When we began articulating about this menace, many of the world's big powers dismissed this as a law and order issue. Now they know better. The question is, what do we do about it? We must all introspect and ask ourselves whether our talk is anywhere close to the action we take. We all, in bilateral and multilateral discussions, condemn this evil and piously resolve to fight it in all our declaratory statements. The truth is, that these have become rituals. 
the fact is that when we are required to fight and destroy this enemy, the self-interest of some leads them towards duplicity. This has been going on for years. Although India proposed a comprehensive convention on international terrorism, CCIT, as early as in 1996, yet two decades later, the United Nations has not been able to agree upon a definition of terrorism. If we cannot agree to define our enemy, how can we fight together? If we continue to differentiate between good terrorists and bad terrorists, how can we fight together? If even the United Nations Security Council cannot agree on the listing of terrorists, how can we fight together? Let us display our new commitment by reaching agreement on the Comprehensive Convention on International Terrorism this year itself. Madam President, I had identified climate change as one of the significant dangers to our existence. India has already said that it is deeply committed to the Paris Accord. This is not because we are afraid of any power, influenced by a friend or foe, or tempted by some imagined greed. This is an outcome of a philosophy that is at least 5,000 years old. Our Prime Minister has, on his personal initiative, launched the International Solar Alliance as witness to our abiding commitment to the cause. Madam President, when we talk of world peace, we mean peace not only among human beings, but also peace with nature. We understand that human nature is sometimes inimical to nature, but we would like to amend human nature when it tends in the wrong directions. When we inflict our greed upon nature, nature sometimes explodes. We must learn to live with the imperatives, cycles and creative urges of nature. In that lies our own salvation. We have just witnessed hurricanes, earthquakes, rains that inundate, storms which terrify. This is not a mere coincidence. Nature sent its warning to the world even before the world's leadership gathered in New York at the United Nations through Harvey. Once. Our gathering began, an earthquake struck Mexico, and a hurricane landed in Dominica. We must understand this requires more serious action than talk. The developed world must listen more carefully than others because it has more capacities than others. It must help the less fortunate through technology transfer and green climate financing. That is the only way to save future generations. Madam President, we are discussing turbulence and change across the world, but the one organization created to address world affairs is beset by its own problems. It seems to believe that it can afford not to change from the precepts and perceptions that determined its birth. On 18 September, there was a meeting here on the UN on UN reform, I participated, I witnessed an evident desire for change to do something. But I do want to remind you that at the 2005 World Summit, there was a consensus that early reform of the Security Council is an essential element of our overall effort to reform the United Nations. efforts at text-based negotiations on the reform and expansion of the Security Council were initiated in the last session and more than 160 nations had expressed support for this effort. If we are serious, then the least we can do is produce one text that can be the basis for negotiation. I hope that under PGA's enlightened leadership, Madam President, this will become a priority. If that happens, it will be his significant achievement. We also have high expectations from the new Secretary General of the United Nations. 
if he wants to reform the peace and security architecture, he will also need to address reforms related to peacekeeping that have been urged for long. Without improvement in UN peacekeeping, this goal can't be achieved. Madam President, there is no shortage of issues. There is even less shortage of problems, which should be recognized from this podium. But time is not always on the side of those who would like to raise issues and problems in the interest of better, more peaceful and progressive future. The issues you have chosen are relevant to the UN Charter, as well as to the ancient traditions of my land. Madam President, my country's culture and thought has been shaped by a history and philosophy that believes in peace as humankind's only rational, practical objective. We truly believe that the world is one family. We hope that every member of this family deserves the elixir of life, happiness. Let me end by reciting a verse that is a synthesis of thought. May all be happy. May all be healthy. May all see what is good. May all be free from suffering. May all be happy. May all be healthy. May all see what is good. May all be free from suffering. May all be free from suffering. May all be free from suffering. I thank you, Mr. President.